I always like to know what perspective my speakers are coming from. Um, to clarify, I am a primary care internal medicine doctor in North Florida now in Gainesville. I serve 4,000 patients. Uh, in addition, I volunteer clinically teach and have appointments uh, at the University of Florida in the College of Medicine uh, Pharmacy and now the Doctor of Nurse Practitioner Program. Um, so I come from a per perspective of a practitioner who's actually interested simply, like you all, here on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock with a beautiful beach outside and taking the best care of my patients. So that's my perspective. Today I'm privileged to address this uh, esteemed audience of colleagues on progesterone, and I'm going to be abbreviating that as P4, and the brain from premenstrual dysphoric disorder to the newer research in traumatic brain injury. Just by show of hands, can you tell me how many um, of our, my colleagues actually prescribe progesterone in total hysterectomized women? Can you just raise your hand? Excellent. So this is an elegant group. Uh, well, for those of you who don't do it yet, you're going to have the science behind why progesterone is much more than just for uh, the gynecological reasons of protecting the uterus. It's a systemic endocrine hormone. So by outline, we're going to review uh, the basics of progesterone. Uh, we'll go through the current neuroscience in terms of the animal models. We're going to review the PROTECT uh, studies coming out of Grady, Dr. Quebec's alma mater at Emory, um, as well as the phase three clinical trial synapse, um, both NIH clinically funded. We'll go through the clinical implications, and I apologize for that formatting error, and traumatic brain injury. Uh, also for our women in premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And then I'm going to uh, expand it to age management medicine and also propose for us to put together a uh, clinical trial. So going back to the basics, progesterone for carrying babies, for progesterone. That's, how, that's all I was taught in medical school back in 1993, but there's a lot more to it. Let's go through the basics. Here we have a 28-day menstrual cycle and the luteal phase where the average uh, peaks during the luteal phase and comes down nicely so that we can have a menstrual period. Um, during pregnancy, however, uh, between the first and the third trimester, it goes up over 100 times, way up here in pregnancy. And it's not surprising that postpartum that there's so much emotional lability afterwards when you have that withdrawal of the progesterone. In my patients, uh, this is an aside in my postmenopausal patients, it seems like my patients feel good for the most part in the, at a level at the mid-luteal phase right about here, which is a, correlates to about 10 to 15. I don't know what you all have found, but that's where generally my patients feel good. So that's generally where I replace the serum level to a, a, a serum level of 10 to 15 nanograms per mil. Uh, don't forget the estrogen, of course, uh, to balance the estrogen, and as well, don't forget the testosterone. But let's go back to the brain. Progesterone is a neuroactive steroid. It actually has regulations in mating and community behavior. There's an excellent review article, and you have copies of my slides, that was just published last year that said at least in rats, giving progesterone helps uh, the stress response such that these uh, rats actually enjoy being in community after being isolated when giving progesterone. So that makes sense. During the luteal phase of our uh, menstrual cycle as women, we would, we, it would seem that um, from a, a, bi a propagation of the species standpoint, we would want to hang out with other people, uh, especially men. There are reparatives responsive to, to the uh, central nervous system as well, which you're going to know in detail in a few minutes. So besides progesterone, which is actually the backbone to the um, other neurosteroids, uh, you've got uh, allopregnenolone, which is, actually has the most research, which is right here. But remember, the grandmother is actually pregnenolone, and you'll see that in sequence, so it's a little bit easier in just a few minutes. But all of these are neuroactive steroids, which actually have um, implications for decrease, decreased inflammation, as well as sitting on the GABA receptor, which is downregulating our um, excitatory response in our neurons. So this is a star, allopregnenolone. Allo is what you'll be seeing. Okay, in the production of allopregnenolone, the step right before, and you're going to see it in just a minute in a little easier fashion, is actually um, uh, an enzymatic reaction of 5-alpha reductase. Uh, 
So it's really important to remember that when we're prescribing finasteride and dutesteride for either BPH or for hair loss tendencies, uh, a common side effect is actually anxiety and depression. I looked it up just this morning to give you some data. Um, in a case series, it was reported 3% up to 40%. Again, let me repeat that. So be careful when you're prescribing 5-alpha reductase inhibitors uh, because you decrease the production of the neurosteroid allopregnenolone. Um, and in, in result, you could have increased anxiety and depression. This was published just a year and a half ago. Uh, and remember, the progesterone is made in, of course, the ovaries, the placenta, the adrenals, especially postmenopausally. But now there's data that's actually um, uh, uh, made in the brain. Okay? So here it is, and I'm so sorry it's small, but I'll walk you through it. So total cholesterol going through uh, the mitochondria, and it goes to uh, pregnenolone. I'm having trouble seeing this. It goes through uh, pregnenolone. It goes to progesterone, um, uh, metabolite of progesterone to allopregnenolone. Just as an aside, because the previous speaker brought up the, is the uh, issue of cholesterol, um, two years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, there was a review of putting teenagers on um, cholesterol-lowering st statin drugs. And one of the arguments against it, amongst others, was that this, would be, this pathway would be disrupted um, here in cholesterol and the neuronal uh, balance. In addition, the black box warning we all got last February about statin drugs, it's here. It statin drugs can affect uh, uh, neuronal function, especially memory. So this was a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, and it showed, this has um, implications for age management medicine, that allopregnenolone aids in neurogenesis and has been found to reverse neuron proliferative deficit and cognitive deficits in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. You could review that at your leisure. I want to talk about stress, because you can't talk about any of these lectures without talking about the big picture. I published a book called Fine Tune Your Hormone Symphony, and this is my integrative model of how I approach patients. Again, I'm a conventional internal medicine doctor who's just trying to do the best for my patients. I see a lot of patients every day, and so the reason I published this was that they could, ha they could have it filled in before they come to see me. But essentially, uh, the patient's the conductor of the hormone symphony. Here are the hormones. Um, but he or she stands on a platform that must be stable in order to conduct the hormones. Um, this is very simple. It's good healthy habits, good relationships, and early detection and control of chronic disease. Here falls genetic medicine, genomic medicine that we heard about this conference. Once this is stable, and only once this is stable, can we approach the uh, hormone symphony, which is strings, wind, percussion, and brass, sex hormones, metabolic um, insulin glucose, thyroid, and vitamin D. And as you know, they're all related. For example, hypovitaminosis D is associated with diabetes. Hypotestosteronism is also associated with metabolic syndrome. But the more, most important part of the book is this section here. You notice the triangle fix, fits down here. In Chinese medicine, we call this the qi. I, I teach some Chinese medicine, too. Um, but it, we put it in West, what, traditional Western medicine into the adrenal glands is what we talk about here. Um, cortex, adrenal cortex, and medulla. But it's much more than that. It's uh, the mind-body spirituality. And I love this group because we get it here. Um, but when I approach a perimenopausal woman who's stressed out, taking care of three kids, working two jobs, trying to be it, be it all for everybody, um, I talk about what you've heard about in this conference referred to as cortisol steel. I've heard it referred to as pregnenolone steel. I call it here progesterone steel. But essentially, it's this pathway, and you've seen it once before, but I'll go over it because it's so important in the care of our patients. And remember that progesterone is the backbone of the neurosteroids, which are calming. So here it is. So uh, remember what Dr. Edwin Lee said. So you, in the cortex, you've got salt, you've got uh, salt, sugar, and sex. Okay, with the cholesterol as a background. So here it, it goes uh, from uh, pregnenolone to progesterone, deoxycorticosterone. When we're stressed, it goes up to cortisol. So you're stealing the progesterone or pregnenolone to make the cortisol. Uh, in addition, you're making more mineralocorticoids, and that's why our patients complain of bloating and feeling wired and tired. I simply explain this to my patients as the hormone hier hierarchy. It's much more important to survive than reproduce, and that's why those hormones get Im imbalanced in our premenstrual and premenstrual dysphoric uh, disorder patients. 
Um, you've heard a lot about estrogen dominance. I'm not going to spend too much time with this. Uh, but essentially, as Dr. Edwin Lee says, and I'm sure all of you could attest, that when we balance uh, estrogen and progesterone, we save marriages. So um, estrogen dominance or progesterone deficiency is like a tiger on the prowl. And we women uh, who are overstressed, progesterone um, insufficient, who get progesterone uh, uh, repletion feel much better, myself included, by disclosure. So let's go through this. This, that, the term, the standard of care, we have to be careful with that because it's a legal term. Um, but I will tell you that, unfortunately, out there in the general conventional medical um, guidelines, that it's suggested that we use serotonin reuptake inhibitors during the luteal phase or throughout for PMS and PMDD. But I'm going to show you the science that you could use to justify why, instead, why don't we use bioidentical progesterone and stress management. Um, there's a ton of literature on sex hormones and neurological disease in women. But here's one. I've seen this a couple of times. Uh, catamenial epilepsy that happens uh, during the menstrual period, especially in uh, the teenage years and young women. Um, and allopregnenolone, remember the star uh, neurosteroid metabolite of progesterone, actually is an end endogenous anticonvulsant. So that's why that happens. Um, so one suggestion would be to put that uh, woman, that menarchal, young woman on progesterone. So there are nervous system effects in both men and women with progesterone. Um, 